So, um, welcome. Can please everybody hear me? Perfect, perfect. So, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to this pilot uh, presentation for what we hope to become a cardiovascular research grand rounds. Um, today, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Chris Lee, <coughs> who is a remarkably active, productive resident, currently third year resident at USC. And he will be talking about COPD as well as uh, arrhythmias in preparation for his oral presentation uh, next week at the CHEST conference. Chris. Thank you, Dr. Konechny. Uh Thank you, everyone, for coming to my grand rounds. Um, again, my name is Christopher Lee. I'm a third year resident here in internal medicine. My talk today is called Subclinical Pulmonary Obstruction and Ventricular Arrhythmogenesis. And we have no financial disclosures or any conflicts of interest. So just a little bit of background about COPD. Um, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, is one of the leading causes of death in the United States. And really, it's the only common etiology of death that continues to rise. Between 1990 and 2010, there was a 58% increase in COPD deaths. Uh, one of the most frequent causes of death in COPD is cardiovascular events. Uh, we know that there's quite a bit of ischemic cardiomyopathy in this population. Uh, for instance, there was a large VA population uh, matched cohort study in which they studied individuals with COPD versus a matched cohort, and essentially saw a 7% increase in the incidence of coronary artery disease versus a matched cohort. Uh, we also know that there's emerging evidence that there's quite a bit more arrhythmogenicity in um, individuals with COPD, um, arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, uh, ventricular tachycardia have all been found to be more frequent in our COPD population. Uh, sort of go along with that, there's uh, quite a bit more sudden cardiac death in this population as well. And so, again, there's increasing evidence that there's more arrhythmogenicity in patients with COPD. Uh, this is a figure from a 2014 retrospective study by Dr. Konechny, uh, really who saw an increased association between arrhythmias as measured by a 24-hour Holter monitor in patients with COPD, roughly 3,000 patients in this study, uh, with MASH controls, which is about 4,000 patients in this study. Uh, really, the y-axis here shows the percent of patients that um, has each arrhythmia, and on the x-axis, it's subdivided by the type of arrhythmia. So AF stands for atrial fibrillation, um, AFL stands for atrial flutter, um, NSVT stands for non-sustained ventricular tachycardia, and sustained ventricular tachycardia after that. And you'll see that the white bars show no COPD, while the increasing gradient all the way to black shows uh, sort of the severity of COPD, black being very severe COPD. And essentially, there's a statistically significant difference as you go from no COPD to each sort of gradient of COPD. Uh, we also know that there's increased mortality in individuals who've been diagnosed with COPD or some combination of COPD and ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, this is also a figure from one of Dr. Koneshny's studies, this one in 2018, essentially looking at survival analysis data. Um, again, the y-axis shows the sur sort of the percent survival, and the x-axis looks at the time in years. Essentially, the graph reveals that there's quite a bit more patients who have COPD and ventricular tachycardias who have increased risk of death from any cause. Uh, the yellow line uh, here shows individuals with no COPD and no ventricular tachycardia, while the red line shows individuals who have both the diagnosis of COPD and ventricular tachycardia, and the blue and green lines essentially show one combination of the other. Um, essentially, in individuals who have a diagnosis of both COPD and ventricular tachycardia, there's about a 50% mortality rate after 10 to 12 years. So essentially, given the independent association and the presence and severity of COPD with cardiovascular disease, uh, we as a group wanted to investigate whether milder subclinical impairments in airflow obstruction could create an increased propensity for ventricular arrhythmogenesis. Um, and really one of the reasons was because prior, a lot of the prior studies were done that were, uh, were retrospective. And any retrospective study really opens you up to some element of selection bias because the study population ends up not being representative um, of sort of the general population and really opens uh, you up to some questionable external validity. And so we hypothesized that um, the presence of subclinical obstructive pulmonary disease uh, could cause some level of increased arrhythmogenesis uh, as compared to a population that didn't have this level of subclinical uh, disease. And so we designed, designed a study, it was a prospective single center study here at USC, in which we enrolled consecutive adult patients who had come to device clinic for their routine outpatient interrogation of their existing device. Um, essentially, their existing implantable device could have been anything from an implantable loop recorder to a pacemaker or, or a defibrillator. 
um, and essentially our patients had no known history of COPD. The participation criteria for our patients essentially meant that they would undergo portable spirometry using the device seen on the table here, and we would record their best out of three attempts uh, to determine their FEV1 and their force vital capacity as well. Uh, we also asked our patients to um, fill out a research questionnaire as well and undergo the routine device interrogations, and we also extracted relevant variables uh, from the pa uh, from patient history via their electronic medical record. And really the exclusion criteria was if the implanted device was less than three months old, so essentially they were new devices and so they had a lack of data, or if their devices lacked the recording ability for premature ventricular contractions. And so here are the patient characteristics, and it's a little bit of a busy slide, but the total number of patients that we accrued into our study was 54, with 41% that were female and 59% that were male. Uh, the average age was 65, and the BMI was 30, and I have the ethnicity data here um, on the screen. And the patient characteristics based on the average spirometer values of all 54 patients, uh, the average force actuated volume over one second was 2.2 liters, which is about 84% of predicted. The force vital capacity was on average 2.6 liters, which was about 78% of predicted. And the FEV1 to FEC ratio was about 83%. And so here are the results of our study, um, and the graphs are divided based on the FEV1 to FEC ratio. On the left, you'll see the ratio as less than 80%, and on the right, you'll see the ratio less than 85%. Um, the y-axis here shows the number of premature ventricular contractions per day, or PVCs per day, and the x-axis essentially further subdivides it based on the patient population that has this impairment versus not. Um, essentially here, you'll see that uh, on the left graph, with FV1 to FEC less than 80% versus greater than 80%, um, there was a st statistically significant difference with more PVCs in the group that had the subclinical impairment, approximately 1,100 PVCs per day versus 150 PVCs per day. And on the right-hand side, you'll see that uh, this kind of held true even if we increase that boundary to FV1 to FEC ratio less than 85%, and so essentially showing us consistent results. Um, on average, for the less than 85%, we had less PVCs, so 650 as we would have expected, uh, versus 34 for the, for the individuals that did not have this impairment. And you have the total number of patients who sort of met uh, each criteria down below. And so sort of in conclusion for, to conclude um, the results of the study, um, we're really, um, as far as we know, the first study to show that there's increased ventricular automaticity in this level of subclinical but significant pulmonary excretory flow limitations. And really given our prior, um, prior ideas into why um, individuals have more ventricular tachycardia in COPD in our large epidemiological studies in the past, this can be a potential mechanism as to why we see so much more VT um, in this patient cohort. Um, as for future studies, um, one, of the mechanis one of the things that we can definitely look for is looking at causal mechanisms such as pathophysiology, whether it's some level of hypoxia or hypercapnia, or whether there's a hemodynamic shift, or whether there's certain medications that can be causing individuals to have more premature ventricular contraction still remains to be seen. Um, but again, these were the findings that we found in our study. And so just to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my research mentor, Dr. Tomas Konechny, um, Dr. Stephen Yao, who's a first-year fellow here who really started this study and uh, just continued throughout the study um, and helped to accrue so many of the patients, uh, James Grinnell and Barbara, who are device techs, and Melissa Ramos, um, who is our uh, research coordinator, Dr. Baroque and Dr. Bader from our pulmonology department, and Dr. Sarte, um, who was my assistant uh, program director and my residency mentor throughout. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Well, uh, if that's okay, we'll save the questions for the end. <clears throat> Thank you for a wonderful presentation. What I'll try to do is with the remaining little bit of time to set things uh, a little bit into perspective, why we think that uh, this project that Chris did <clears throat> together with all the collaborators is, is important. Um, again, we can see my slides, perfect. So heart and lungs. I also don't have conflicts, although I am on the ABIM standard setting committee, so I have to say that none of these uh, questions will resemble boards uh, in any way. 
Heart and lungs, they're neighbors. <clears throat> no question about it. Like any neighbors, they get along very well under some circumstances, but there might be rough times, and that's particularly what we're interested in. When there is a pulmonary pathology, the question is how does it influence the heart? And I included this gray, um, Gray's Anatomy picture because really one cannot escape the notion how intertwined their relationships even anatomically, but certainly physiologically are. I would a little bit mention a few things outside of COPD, but uh, the primary focus today will be on the relationship between COPD and arrhythmias. So is it still relevant? Should we care about oxygen and COPD these days? Well, I'd like to think so. Chris probably would like to think so. But perhaps even the Nobel um, Prize Committee thinks so, as this year's uh, prize was given for low oxygen adaptation on cellular and molecular level to three um, authors um, who, who worked extensively on still many unknowns which surround how our physiology and pathophysiology works with low oxygen states. And what more common low oxygen state and pathology to study than COPD, one could ask. Um, I know this is probably repetition and everybody in this room knows a lot about COPD, but just in case, uh, COPD really is a pathology of distal airways. Can we see the pointer? Yes. The distal airways uh, ultimately through a fairly complex uh, 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 um, pathophysiological mechanism ultimately lead to a problem with breathing out, with expiration. And <clears throat> while normal lungs can expire fairly forcefully, that expiration is impaired in someone with COPD. Now, of course, COPD is a rising problem. Um, Potentially, that's because of uh, smoking, where smoking, <clears throat> after many years, leads to COPD. And in the United States, this is accentuated by the fact that really smoking was common about those 20, 30 years ago, and it takes about that time for the COPD to, to develop. I wanted to highlight from this uh, uh, slide with causes of mortality in the United States, that actually COPD is the one of the few ones, and Chris mentioned it, but let me, let me just double, double a focus on that. It's one of the only very common pathologies and causes of mortality in the United States which continue to dramatically rise. Um, thankfully, heart disease is coming down thanks to uh, also research community and preventive efforts and so forth. But COPD increased, and you mentioned the fact, by, by about 60% between the years 1990 and 2010. I mean, the mortality of patients of COPD increased by 60%. Um, and actually, I'll do a small correction. In the past few years, the estimates are that now COPD is the third leading cause of death, as it's actually more common as a cause of death than stroke. Now, n globally, Worldwide, this is becoming an even more immense problem, as actually smoking cessation is by far uh, not controlled in many areas of the world. And I would like to highlight on this uh, worldwide slide that COPD is projected to actually next year get to number five cause of morbidity worldwide. But not to sound overly pessimistic and a little bit light in the presentation, we are winning some, some other um, diseases. Uh, so I, I noted that diarrheal, dis diarrheal, diarrheal disease are actually getting better. Now COPD, back to the, the serious stuff, COPD kills, but we don't exactly know why. What we do know is that the more severe COPD, here depicted as purple and blue, kills or patients with such severe COPD die more, and they die tremendously more. If uh, this is uh, our data, but this has been replicated both by the NIH group as well as the uh, group in Holland. And, and, and I think it surprised everybody how significant that rate actually is. But even milder versions of COPD, and that's r what really led to our project, is, is there maybe some portion of even subclinical pulmonary impairment that could be associated with mortality? <clears throat> 
And there, there is uh, evidence out there showing that it's not just smokers. I mean, smokers are, and ex-smokers are the obvious group that one associates with COPD. But I'd like to, in this slide, have you focus on the red bars, which are people who never smoked, and yet when measuring their pulmonary function, here are the people who are most impaired, and on the right side, excellent pulmonary function. Their cardiovascular mortality still correlates very well with pulmonary function. So what we propose is that it is not just smoking, and we have to actually, in areas such as LA and elsewhere, where perhaps influence of smog, uh, other pollutants, new devices which substitute smoking, still have to be very carefully assessed. Now, when we looked at severity of COPD, and Dr. Bader and, and, and his colleagues from pulmonary will know a thousand things more about this than I do, but there are various measures of COPD severity. And I think that's really key for the need for cross, uh, uh, sort of cross-disciplinary collaborations. In this work, we try to look at the different measures that people propose that can be obtained from spirometry and specifically from pulmonary function testing. And we looked at the mortality in these patients for the, for the sake of time, I won't go into details, but it is not that all measures are equal. And for, for clarity, today we'll be focusing on COPD as measured by FEV1, which commonly is recognized as the gold standard indeed. Uh, this work, uh, by the way, was uh, when, we, when we first presented it, it got us the, the Young Investigator Prize at CHEST because uh, we try to actually use this data to even shed a little bit of light, why would people with these different impairments actually die more? And it definitely highlighted that we cannot do this alone. The, in my opinion, and I, I believe many of us share this, that this is not just a cardiology project. This is not a pulmonary project. This is really a interdisciplinary project, which Perhaps that's one of the reasons why COPD has not been evaluated in terms of cardiovascular disease as well, because it really takes all the disciplines to participate. And I would also like to argue that USC has that unique opportunity to actually put these dis multidisciplinary teams together. Now, COPD patients die more, but what do they die of? Many times we think about people who used to smoke or who have COPD as having lung cancer or pulmonary issues primarily. But it is actually cardiovascular events which are the most common cause of death of a patient with COPD. And besides our group, again, this has been replicated multiple times. Of course, one thinks about cardiovascular events in the context of other cardiovascular risk factors. For example, patient with COPD may have hypertension or diabetes uh, and so forth. So in this, uh, multi, um, uh, in this uh, multivariate analysis, we try to actually put COPD um, and uh, uh, use the odds ratios of COPD as a predictor of mortality, but also cardiac mortality in the right, uh, on the right side. And I will actually add a little bar showing what odds ratio, how does COPD compare in terms of predicting cardiac mortality to other well-recognized cardiovascular risk factors. And you can see that actually it lands right at the level of well-recognized risk factors such as hypertension, uh, even diabetes. And so perhaps I would also argue that COPD needs to be better recognized and better understood as a significant problem for patients with cardiovascular disease. Now, I, it's true, I'm an EP guy. I will not go down the very complex tunnel of atherosclerosis and coronary disease. But there is actually, it turns out, an EP perspective to COPD. Uh, and from my brief uh, function uh, um, ongoing on, on the ABIM boards, actually this is a typical ECG, which in, in theory could appear on the boards. Um, now, there are many residents I know here, and I also put the answer over there, so I won't kind of call on anyone. But this shows a multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is really for many boards purpose questions, pathognomonic with COPD, and that's what we're supposed to circle on those boards. 
Now, why that is? Why do people with COPD and pulmonary diseases have increased atrial arrhythmogenicity? And specifically, what this is, is atrial automaticity. And the answer is we don't know. And, and I really looked. We don't know, and that, I think, is a key to also Chris's project. Because if patients with COPD have increased multifocal atrial arrhythmogenicity, one could propose that similar type of predisposition for arrhythmias could exist also in the ventricles with potentially dramatic circumstances and, and consequences. And, and, you know, I'll briefly look, uh, show the same slide that Chris had just to highlight one thing. I mean, look at that nice dose-response relationship between COPD severity and arrhythmias. I mean, this is, you know, any, anybody who does these larger epidemiologic research, we, we can adjust this for all we want, and we really tried. Of course, it's a retrospective study, so we can never be perfect. But we really tried, and this relationship is just staggering. It's difficult to explain it in terms of um, uh, heart attacks, in terms of risk factors, and so forth, at least the ones that we commonly recognize. And hence, ventricular tachycardias are more common. Again, this is something that has been replicated. And we try to see what significance does COPD have to predicting these. And again, it's among the top other well-recognized predictors of arrhythmias. Uh, in cardiovascular patients. So we looked at those echoes. I mean, what can we do? Echo is such a nice tool. We have them available on so many patients. And we try to compare what differs between patients with COPD and without. And we have some promising, um, I would say, uh, ideas for research. Left ventricular function seemed somewhat different, lower in COPD. Importantly, right ventricular size and function seem different, and that could be, I would argue, one important aspect, because when we indicate defibrillator these days, you know, we don't really look at right function, and certainly not in patients with COPD. And I will also, for the sake of time, go down to these two numbers on the bottom. Cardiac output, as estimated by ECHO, was actually similar in patients with or without COPD. But why that is? because they tend to compensate. They actually have to increase their heart rate because their stroke volume on average is lower to maintain similar cardiac output, or at least that's what, what this kind of retrospective data try to, in my opinion, suggest. And so what we then extended this to is saying, well, is this increased sympathetic drive, increased need for cardiac um, uh, automaticity, such as sinus rate, heart rate, actually extend it to increase number of ventricular tachycardias that could be uh, potentially lethal. This is a busy slide from our um, recent publication in Heart Rhythm, but I'd like to, if you don't mind, walk you through that. On the bottom, we have COPD severity, and we tr also showed the known left ventricular ejection fraction, particularly in the cutoffs that we commonly use for the high and medium risk cohorts from ventricular tachycardia standpoint. For example, patients with ejection fraction less than 40% would commonly be indicated for consideration of a defibrillator, implant of a defibrillator, which we can place. Now, please appreciate that, of course, as we would expect and know, patients with worse EF, with worse left ventricle function, have a higher rate of ventricular tachycardia. No surprise there. So, for example, if you look at patients with no COPD, they just have more and more VT, and certainly the left ventricle impaired cohort has the highest rate. But I'd like you then to compare that relationship to the one from, with COPD severity. In any of the groups, if you look at the patients with preserved left ventricular function, you still see that patients with increasing COPD severity have high risk of VT, and actually the risk of very severe patients with COPD, even though they have preserved left ventricular function, is very similar to that of the ones where we implant defibrillators pretty routinely in, in that dark gray cohort. And I think that's really the key what we wanted to explain. Well, can we 
help to protect or treat patients which have the significant ventricular automaticity and arrhythmogenesis? And can we find a little bit more about it? Because it does kill them. This is the you know, association of mortality with the presence of COPD and ventricular tachycardia, as Chris mentioned as well. And I'd like to highlight just two quick take-home things. It's definitely worse to have COPD, and it's definitely worse to have ventricular tachycardia or significant ventricular tachycardia on Holter monitor. But what is the worst is to have both. The survival after COPD, and in this case it's, it's adverse, it's a mortality, is definitely related to some of the findings on echo, and it's not just the left ventricular function. We try to look at stroke volume, which seems to, again, suggest that stroke volume is an important predictor. And right ventricular estimated pressures from echo also seem to play an important role, suggesting that perhaps there is a point in looking at the right-sided issues in patients with COPD. Now, I know this is a relatively long talk, but so I'll try to a little bit bring it, bring it home to here to USC. And I would like to just introduce what we're trying to do here besides Chris's project. Chris's project is really a result of a long, complex preparation on, which included a huge collaboration both with our pulmonary as well as bioengineering as well as general medicine sections. And we, we are very fortunate that we have very gifted trainees, students, internal medicine residents, and fellows who are um, uh, eager and, and willing to participate in these projects. Now, in return, I wanted to, because I, I see some, some of you in this audience, I want to also tell you that uh, it, it, there are nice rewards from participating in these projects. And it's uh, definitely Chris's example, as he will be standing in front of, I think, a very uh, uh, eager audience at the chest meeting next week. But we've had presentations at the Paris ESC this year. Uh, we have um, even Christian here who presented. This is his photo from the ACC this spring. And we've had multiple presentations at other major meetings. So um, I think our collaboration works. And we're also able to um, show that we have some grant uh, results as well, at least here. And it's particularly rewarding to hear when one of our um, uh, collaborators or uh, trainees who go through this program and then interviews and meets other people as it actually often happens uh, and it's it's very uh, interesting that uh, Chris actually recently interviewed is that okay if I share that yeah he uh, recently interviewed in a, in a well-recognized program on an east coast where one of our previous uh, um, uh, graduates kind of came from, uh, is, is now working as a fellow and it was just so interesting to see their interaction so we're hoping to continue building these projects up not just for the research sake but also for the sake of furthering everybody, everybody's interests and education. And let me briefly mention what else we're doing. Uh, again, this is, again, in the context of time, I don't want to take too much, uh, too much of your time, but COPD is certainly not the only low oxygen state. And I started it off with those mentions of Nobel Prize and all these things, and which, which sound very grand, but there are so many patients and uh, willing volunteers around us who actually suffer from low oxygen states, one of which is sleep apnea. And so one of our work also looks at the very similar indices that actually Chris is looking at, ventricular automaticity, and, and certainly at a the, at the deeper level, both on atrial and ventricular measures of arrhythmogenesis in patients with sleep apnea. And we hope to look at similar uh, things also in the COPD population. So just to give you a little sample, this is a, for example, what we recorded in patients with sleep apnea as their oxygen changes. You see the dashed line over here, which is the oxygen change and their saturation. So at the beginning of sleep apnea, they're at uh, baseline and then they drop their oxygen. And we actually are looking very closely at not just heart rate or big things like ventricular tachycardia, but how do small pro-arrhythmogenic changes occur in the context of low oxygen? In this case, for example, QT interval. How does PR interval? How does P wave duration change? 
And we certainly hope to develop further and further collaborations within cardiology as well, and we, have, we are very fortunate that we have an uh, um, uh, excellent group, both from imaging and heart failure perspective as well, and as well as our interventional colleagues. Let me give you another small sample. This is uh, from the cath lab, and uh, I hope uh, this will wake up ev anybody who perhaps thinks that this is too long of a, as this is actually a patient who was in the cath lab who fell asleep in the cath lab during the procedure, and just turns out that he had fairly heavy snoring, and at the time we had, we enrolled him in, in a different study, but we had the availability of intracardiac ultrasound in place. So let, for those of you who are not familiar with this, let me briefly introduce you to that. So we see here ultrasound in the right atrium. Can everybody see that pointer? Yeah, hopefully. Is that right? Okay. There is an interatrial septum, and here is left atrium, is that big ball in the middle. And as the patient fell asleep, we can see that breathing is so closely intertwined with cardio cardiac function, cardiac uh, measures of arrhythmogenicity, cardiac uh, size, and so forth. Um, and in this case, let me just highlight that whenever the patient snores, and you hear that loud snore, look how that PFO opens and how, how actually blood shunts from the right to the left atrium. You know, and the, again, we were the first ones to show that. This is something that we got award from ACC, uh, potentially as a, as a cause of paradoxical embolism. But it's the, these exact observations that we, we strive to continue to make um, here at USC. And ultimately, I'd like to close with uh, saying that I think research can be fun, and certainly cardiopulmonary research can be fun. And this is a, a list of uh, some of the awards which our, our team received. And the picture is from when we went to uh, present it at a nice place uh, in, in Hawaii. And with that, I'd like to close. And thank you for your attention. And if possible, I'd like to open it up for questions, specifically, of course, to me, but also please for Chris, as he welcomes any feedback for his. Uh, he will have five minutes of questions at that conference. Let me bring you the microphone, if that's OK, Dr. Bader. Uh, thank you, Tom. A very nice talk. Very nice t talk, Chris. So you know it's been two years since we discussed this project, Tom. So all of a sudden several questions pop into my mind. So for, first of all, just as an aside, just to let you know that the um, prevalence of COPD in men has started to decline. The, uh, the statistics you showed there were last uh, cited in 2010, but since about 2012-2013, it's rapidly declining because uh, thanks to public health education, smoking has declined in men. But COPD is actually continues to increase in women. So that might be something in your future from an epidemiological standpoint, something you might want to focus on uh, relating uh, this aspect of your study between the uh, genders. That's a general comment. My next question to you is, what was your, how did you define COPD? <laughs> No, no, hold it. Let him answer because you said he's going to uh, have to confront the reviewers, right? So our definition of COPD was based on the COPD gold criteria. So we went off the FV1 to FEC ratio. Um, we understand that there are also FEV1 parameters and also just you know simple FEC parameters as well, but sort of just based on the normal classification mechanisms that we use, we went based off the gold criteria where the FEV1 to FEC so ratio at less than 70% with an FEV1. So your yep. mean was 83%. Correct. Minus 10%, which means that the lowest FEV1 DC ratio was 73%. Correct. Um, at least in the patient population that we were enrolling, uh, we didn't, you know, have a patient population that had COPD in our device clinics. So how can you say these patients have COPD? They, they don't. They're, they have subclinical you know, pulmonary obstructive okay. disease, um, really just based on the FV1 to FEC ratio of... Subclinical, but it's 83%. Some of them were as high as 93%. Sure. Which is 
is um, a, for a phenotype of COPD, which can only be detected by high-resolution re high CT scanning, in patients have completely normal spirometries. Now, unless you have uh, HRCTs on all of the patients that you listed, and can argue that all of these people had structural changes consistent with COPD, you cannot argue that they have COPD in the presence of this uh, lung function testing. All right, that's one, that's one question I have. Did you get the uh, um, oxygen tension? Did you measure either pulse ox or blood gases in these patients? We did. Uh, the average pulse ox was around 96%. Oh, oh, perfect, thank you. The average pulse ox was around 96%. We're still mm -hmm. going through the rest of sort of the characteristic data as we go through the subgroups, but preliminarily, mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't see any differences in sort of the blood pressure or the oxygen or the heart rates between the two groups. Okay, and uh, were all your patients either current or past smokers? Uh, not all the patients. Um, roughly, I would say when we were going through the data, about 30% of the patients were current or former smokers. Um, that percentage increased in the group that had um, a lower, the, again, what we define as subclinical disease. Um, and so I believe in the subclinical disease as of less than 80%, in the less than 80% group, um, the smoking had gone up to, or current or fat past smoking had gone up to around uh, 50%, whereas the other group was around 30%. So, uh, you know, you mentioned the gold criteria, but you know, in 2017, the gold criteria completely changed as far as um, gauging the severity of COPD. It is no longer based on the FEV1. It is now based on numbers of exacerbations and how the patient feels based on the uh, some commonly used symptom questionnaire, such as the MMRC or the St. George's questionnaire. Um, you know, I'm still. I have to. I hate to say this, but I'm still puzzled uh, as to how any of these patients can be considered to have COPD. I don't understand where you get the term subclinical from. So they don't. And uh, Chris, that's a very helpful question because I'm sure you will face that at chest. And you, I would consider highlighting it more because there's nobody with COPD in this study. Nobody. So what we're looking at is pulmonary function as a predictor of arrhythmogenicity. And the idea is, I would draw a parallel to how cholesterol was thought of as predictor of heart attacks. You know, you could, if you study people with, who just have a heart attack, it's very difficult to go back 20, 30 years. So what we're trying to say is these patients, we have some lung function at this point, and they're actually pretty good. I mean, these lung functions are not definitely not severe COPD. They're not, they don't even qualify as COPD. But that lung function correlates with how much arrhythmias they have. And what I'm trying to suggest that there may be, even though their impairment for breathing comes at those lower levels, and of course that's where the diagnostic criteria is relevant for COPD because then they have exacerbations and so forth. From arrhythmia standpoint, we might be interested at even the much healthier cohort because if we can use some of that prediction and we can know, for example, who to treat more with beta blockers or in whom to limit perhaps exposure to air pollutants and so forth. That's what we're hoping to actually strive. And even to us that, uh, Dr. Bader, that's actually what I think made, made Chess choose this presentation is because it surprised us in the first place how strong that difference or that relationship is. Because really the pulmonary function is not that impaired in, me in most of these patients at all. That's right. Even in the relatively healthy patients, basically, who have no clue whether they have any pulmonary disease. We did. Can you show it? Yeah, sure. One more time. Yeah. Uh, can I have yeah. a couple more comments? Okay. So there are, there are two more um, possible mechanisms I'd like to propose for this uh, interesting findings that you described. Uh, as you know, COPD is actually a systemic disorder, yeah. which uh, is it's a basically a catabolic state with a lot of wasting of the skeletal muscle system. And given that the heart is part of the skeletal muscle system, one could argue that uh, you know years of smoking and the the breakdown of the myofibrils might contribute to um, that. I see that now might contribute uh, 
to the the arrhythmogenesis and the general fact that the left ventricular ejection fraction may be affected. That's one possibility. In other words, a direct effect on the on the muscle, striated muscle of the heart. Uh, the second thing is, is another interesting finding that's been found by researchers recently, is that, and this is seen people with very severe COPD. We're talking about ratios of less than 50% predicted. You also have a concomitant increase in your air trapping with residual volume and functional residual capacity. The lungs become so hyperinflated that they actually start compressing the heart from all sides. The heart is literally being squeezed by... Uh, especially the lower lobes of the lungs, which are beginning to encroach on the ventricles. So one could argue, and I don't know if anybody's actually correlated with echo findings, that as the, lung, the lungs increase in volume, that the left ventricular end diastolic volume might be reduced rather than in the left ventricle, not the right ventricle, reduced so that the cardiac output might be theoretically impaired. Now you notice in your study, you didn't find any difference between the two uh, Cardiac outputs. Was that in the Mayo study? I forgot. Yeah. The Mayo study, right. Yeah. So that, that could be another potential factor here. But I do agree that uh, the, the left ventricular dysfunction uh, in people's COPD has been actually known for about 50 years. And it has nothing to do with ischemia or pulmonary hypertension or the shifting of the septum into the left ventricle, anything of this sort. It's a separate independent phenomenon for which as yet no adequate explanation has been given. Uh, but I think the, the pursuit of gas exchange and particularly nocturnal hypoxemia is a, is a very nice thought. And uh, this business about, you know, the cutoffs at 80, 85 percent is really a puzzle. That tells me uh, it, it has to do with something other than airway function. And, uh, and I think can't explain it other than the fact that it may have something to do with changes in the striated muscle of the myocardium. And that's been implied by these other indirect uh, factors. Thank you, Dr. Vader. Dr. Cloner. So one question you might get is, you know, your results focus on PVCs per day. So uh, as a cardiologist, I'm gonna be more interested in what about episodes of ventricular tachycardia? What about episodes of atrial fibrillation? or other arrhythmias. Can you address that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Cloner. Um, we, as a study that only had 54 patients enrolled, we didn't have uh, clinically significant numbers of patients who had ventricular tachycardias. And so given that small number, there ended up not being a very significant difference in between the groups. Um, hopefully larger studies in the future would be able to address this and you know, hopefully be able to find a correlation. Uh, but as of right now, in our study, just more, more restricted because of the number uh, we weren't able to see that correlation. Just what about atrial sorry. arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation especially? We didn't Flutter. also see that correlation either. Um, but again, hopefully in a larger study, we would be able to sort of address that similar. And Chris, you you want to actually answer this a tricky question because the project started before before you were started, right? So when, when Stephen and I devised this thing, we actually are not looking at, because we know the VT is more common. You know, I mean, we've showed that in 5,000 patients, and there, it's very difficult logistically to replicate that, you know, here. So what I was actually, what we were hoping to discover is more the mechanism. Because everybody focuses on scar, low ventricular function, you know, MIs, while actually automaticity has been pretty overlooked. And yet we have that math, you know, that whole atrial theme where actually I would argue that perhaps there is a reason to believe that they have increased a, a, uh, automaticity based on whatever, you know, mechanisms. So that's what we were trying to. And actually this is a, the, the results are very surprising. I mean, they're so surprisingly different that it's actually very, we have to really look at the data closer and, 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 and know better. Thank you. Very, very nice presentation, and Tom and, and Chris. I, I may have missed because I came a little into your presentation, but what uh, I haven't seen here is the cardiac difference of this patient. I understand that the patient population was pulled from a device clinic, but it's a mixed population, some with pacemakers, some with the ICD, some with implanted devices for monitor arrhythmia. And I'm absolutely sure that there is a tremendous difference in the 
cardiac characteristic of this patient because the one with the ICD highly likely all or 90 something percent have very bad EF while the ones that only have a pacemaker is a complete different population and the ones that have a monitor another different population. So without going to the pulmonary side that Dr. Beidur addressed that this does not appear in Dr. Koneche said to be a population with significant pulmonary abnormalities and your goal was to see even in mild uh, pulmonary function test abnormality the correlation with arrhythmia but my question is the difference in arrhythmia in this population that does not appear to have any significant pulmonary abnormality may be actually based on the fact of their different cardiac pathology. Because obviously, and I didn't see it here, so can you show that the incidence of arrhythmia also had a relationship between EF, which I'm pretty sure it will be. I cannot believe that the patient with higher PVCs per day have the same EF that the one, you understand? So where is this data? Thank you so much, Dr. Ostrega. Um, it's great to hear from you. Um, so we don't have echocardiogram data on every single patient that's enrolled in the trial. However, what we do have is uh, sort of the indication as to why they got their device. Um, so roughly in about 30%, 30 percent of our patients were, had gotten the device for primary prevention. Approximately 10 percent had gotten the devices for secondary prevention. Another 33% or so had gotten the devices for uh, complete heart block, another 10% for uh, bradycardia. And so these were the indications. And one of our sort of surrogate measures to be able to see, and again, we're still analyzing the data and still sifting through all of this, um, had been sort of do the indications sort of match up percentage wise. Are we only going to see sort of in this subclinical impairment where we see more premature ventricular contractions? Are we going to see that they're all in this subclinical group with the primary prevention and secondary prevention? And that was not the case. Um, percentage wise, it's an even split between the two groups who have you know more PVCs and who do not have more PVCs. Obviously, we could be better and we could you know in the future also have you know cardiac function for every single you know patient who comes in. However, um, just based on the indications as to why they got the devices, there was no difference percentage wise between the two. Primary prevention, second prevention, both of them have common denominator low EF. But you have patient with pacemaker and patient with uh, monitor arrhythmia that probably have preserved EF. And so that's the issue is maybe what you show here is a fluke. Obviously, it's very impressive, but I, I have no explanation. As you said, 85%, 80%, both of them are normal. This can be a fluke. I don't know. The other is if you put here... EF less than 30% and preserve EF, I cannot believe that they will have the equal uh, uh, incidence of arrhythmia. And then maybe that's the issue in this population and not the very mild abnormal pulmonary function test. I don't know. May I? Or do you want to? So no, uh, just a few seconds. Dr. Ostrega's question is exactly right on. I mean, if, if this was at ACC, I think this would be the first question, right? So you want to, I think, have a clear, you know, f few sentences. So let me give you a suggestion of what I would say, right? So the purpose, with 50 patients, of course, we cannot, you know, we cannot do that. But we do have other available data. And you can show my slide, if you remember, where there's that ejection fraction for which we adjusted in a cohort of 5,000 patients with known echo and known VT. We don't, these retrospective data are always dirty, so we'll never know for sure, but it was actually surprising to us that it was, there was, the signal was so strong independent of the left ventricle function, that that's really what led us down this path. And what a little bit supported our path is the thinking on lung function is changing. Do you guys remember how, even I remember it 10 years ago, we were like afraid, or 15 years ago, f afraid to give beta blockers to patients with COPD. You remember that? And basically the accumulating data, and Dr. Bader would be the first one to kind of mention that, is that showing the opposite, that maybe we are actually wrong. Maybe this whole idea where we are not allowing the benefit of beta blockers to patients with, let's say, clinical COPD is actually a wrong notion. And maybe we've been wrong. There is definitely, I'm no question there is an EF component. I mean, no question about it. But see, I'm talking about the patients who have preserved EF and we could be missing them 
And what an opportunity to do use like a cheapo spirometry, which by the way, any of you can try out. That's our device in that front thing. It's very portable. It costs, you know, very little. And if that could help us stratify patients, we have a multitude of novel, readily available therapies. It's not just defibrillator placement. We have funny current antagonists. We have Ivabradine. We have, of course, beta blockers and selective beta blockers to boot. We have oxygen options. We have limitations in what they're exposed to. I mean, wouldn't that be interesting to counsel patients who have, who have let's say, these pre, pre, higher predisposition, hey, that maybe they shouldn't actually live or work in a high smog or pollutant environment. You know, maybe for them actually, you know, it's, it's, it's particularly tricky. And there is data from Oregon study that actually sudden death is also related to this. But we definitely need to learn more. If I may just, it, it came to me when you were talking that may, may help something. Many years ago, Dr. Kayam and myself, Dr. Mayer and others did something, because here you are looking at arrhythmogenesis as relate to pulmonary abnormalities. And we look at arrhythmogenesis in pregnancy. And why I bring suddenly? Because the idea was to look, based on just observation, if truly there was factual evidence that there is a higher incidence of arrhythmia during pregnancy when the only variant for this individual is being pregnant. I mean, we took the same patient with their own controls before, during, and after pregnancy with Holter monitor at the time. And this was not a big study, the study was probably in American Journal of Cardiology, that basically the bottom line of the study was that showed, no doubt, that there was a higher prevalence of arrhythmias of different type, be isolated PACs, PVCs, runs of SVT, and even short runs of triplets VT. And this was very clear, higher incidence statistics significant during pregnancy as opposed to before and after which basically the conclusion of, the, of this study was that pregnancy per se appears to be an arrhythmogenic condition of different degree of severity. And the reason I bring it is because suddenly I think what's going on with pregnancy in the lungs? Obviously you know better than me, but could it be that part of the mechanism of why during pregnancy, we thought there is more the catecholamine issue, the hormonal issue, but could it be that it's something also with the lung, the fact that the diaphragm is being pushed upward. I don't know what happened, probably it's known, with the lung function during pregnancy. But I, I, it just occurred to me that in this case, we showed that there is more arrhythmia in pregnancy. And the question is, could it be that there is a pulmonary component to this higher arrhythmogenesis during pregnancy that may be a common denominator to your issue here, that every, everything comes down to some degree of hypoxia or whatever. I don't know. Dr. Clavijo. Thank you, Chris. Great job, Tom. Thank you so much for organizing this. I mean, I, it's a lot of work, so thank you for doing that. Um, have you tried to do a correlation between FEB1 and, and, and PVCs or arrhythmogenesis and FEB1, FBC ratios and, and, and PVCs? Have you done that yet? We're still working on it, um, but Initially, it looked promising, but we're still running the data. Right, because I mean, the, the question is there a correlation? Is there a correlation between one and the other? Mm -hmm. And if not, then you need to start looking at something that is causing both PVCs and pulmonary disease, something that is not being identified yet. And you had at the end of the slide, you know, what are the future plans? And, sure. And, sure. and I wanted to make a comment and ask you what you will want to do next to follow up on the study. And I personally, I think that it would be very interesting to have a global biomarker to just look at AMP, BNP, or something sure. like that. But what are, what are your thoughts? Um, for me, I mean, a lot of my thoughts sort of revolve around sort of as to why this is happening. But um, sort of to design, I think one of our major weaknesses of this study was sort of the, net, the low patient number. Um, and sort of as Dr. Astrega was mentioning, the lack of sort of cardiac function parameters that we had. And so sort of in a future study, given you know, what we've seen so far, um, a larger study would, number one, be, you know, a good study to start off with, a much adequately powered study, first of all, where every person has, you know, an echocardiogram, every person has, um, you know, these risk factors, including blood tests such as BNP, um, that we could 
utilized to further measure um, sort of what is going on. And so I think pathophysiologically that would also be able to explain or partly explain uh, what's going on. Um, but absolutely, I think a larger study with those same cardiac parameters that we've missed in our study would also be sort of be a benefit in the future. You see some of these patients have pacemakers, right? Was oh, there yes. a difference oh. in pacing? Yeah, that's right. So this is quantified from pacemakers. So this is over three month period prior to the screening. And let, let me just give a quick, so Dr. Clavijo actually already hinted at the answer very well, right? Mm -hmm. So absolutely. You, so actually larger, in my opinion, is not going to help at all. Because you can, okay, it confirms findings, but it's so consistent with other data. It's just more the mechanism we're trying to solve, right? So what I would argue is I would love to know where these PVCs are coming from. Is it left ventricle? Is it right ventricle? Is it outflow track? Is it from the scar, where the echo shows maybe there's a scar, you know, th that kind of stuff. Uh, of course, correlations with known arrhythmogenic foci would be s particularly helpful. Or is it different? Is it like in the atria that these are maybe multifocal PVCs? You know, sort of the, the parallel to that math. The other thing, absolutely the, the mechanisms of inflammation of heart failure or stretch and all those mechanisms would be tremendously helpful and definitely um, we hope that our future potential funding might allow us to do that. I actually think that it would be interesting also to look at the, at the pulmonary function test before and after the pacer. That's right, that's right. And uh, maybe last yeah. question for Dr. Bader and then we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll conclude if that's okay. Right, I want to uh, respond to uh, Dr. Ostrega's um, hypothesis, we know, we know very well what happens to lung function during pregnancy. In healthy women, um, there's very little difference, um, a hardly any difference in the vital capacity at all, even when they lie down. The only change that occurs is a slight reduction in the functional residual capacity, which is the amount of air remaining in your lung after a normal relaxed expiration uh, when you lie down. Uh, we, in fact, just recently completed a study looking at uh, lung function in cystic fibrosis patients before and after delivery. And we had a total of 23, which for a rare disease is pretty good. And surprisingly, I was hoping to find radical differences before and after. There were none. If anything, the only difference we found was in smaller airways index, which is the terminal airflow limitation, the FEF 2575, which decreased a little bit just prior to delivery and then took about three to four months to recover after the patient's delivered. But one thing that is also known is that the intravascular blood volume during the last, particularly the last three months of pregnancy, increases by 25 to 30 percent, which means that, and that also corresponds to an increase in cardiac output by anywhere from 15 to 20 percent, especially during the last trimester. So given the fact that the, you know, the heart becomes more hyperdynamic, the cardiac output increases, you probably have more stretching of your atria, more uh, increase in your end diastolic ventricular volume, which may contribute to more stretching and irritability of the, uh, of the ventricle, which can theoretically lead to increased uh, arrhythmogenesis, as you mentioned. So that, that more than anything else, more than lung function and gas exchange, probably contributes. It's actually a direct mechanical effect by the circulation, by the circulatory effects. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming, and please let us know your feedback on if you liked it. Thank you.